invite our acknowledgement of country from Tony Janke. Good morning, everyone. My name is Tony Janke. I am a Woodathi and Mirian woman. My family originally come from Cape York and the Torres Strait, Murray Island in the Torres Strait. I live on Yagara land in Mianjin in the Archdiocese of Brisbane. And we begin today's proceedings by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land that we are gathered on, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. I also pay my respects to elders past, present and yet to come and all First Nations member, members and people joining us to the, today in person and online. This acknowledgement is important because it reminds us that we gather together on sacred ground. And I would now like to invite you to join me in singing our opening reflection, which has been co-written by myself and Maeve Heaney. And I'd also invite Sally Fitzgerald to light the plenary council candle. Thank you, Sally.
And so to start this morning, let's pray together our canticle verse. Be praised, my Lord, for our brother's wind and air and every kind of weather by which you, Lord, uphold life in all your creatures. gather as God's people with our hopes, our dreams, our brokenness, our frustrations. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We gather attentive to our ever-present God, who speaks the words of wisdom we need in discerning times. We gather to follow Jesus, who Who encourages encourages us to never never fear, fear, for he he is near. We gather to be filled with the Spirit, who anoints us as we can go. Today, let us make a covenant with this land. As new fruit can be grafted onto the branch of a mature tree, may we wish to be grafted onto the ancient heritage of this land of our first people, so that its life may flow through us. We commit ourselves to this land that we live in and all who belong to it. We will care for it with gentleness, patience, strength and compassion, rather than merely something to be bought and sold. We will look on the land as a gift for which we are truly thankful and undertake the privileged duty of respecting and looking after it. We thank the great Creator Spirit for all the earth provides, water, food, and all the riches above and below the ground. And we undertake to use them wisely, daringly, while ensuring that any development brings danger to no one. 
As we enter more deeply into the spirit of the land, we will see it as a sacrament and icon of our mothering creator spirit. Let us be still now. Listen to the breath of the spirit which has blown through this land for ages past. Today and always. For this is the spirit of the dreaming. The first Genesis creation story says the mighty wind was present at the very beginning of creation. In the second creation story, we are offered the image of the transcendent and powerful God who gathers up earth and mud and lovingly moulds each indentation, dimple and crevice into the human person breathing divine spirit and life that animates the human into a living being. Here is an expression of God's tender imminence. God is as close to us as our very breath. Scripture tells us in many ways that it is through the gift of the Holy Spirit that God is the animator of all living things. The Hebrew word for spirit is ruhak, which also means the breath of God. God breathed life into us at the moment of creation and continues to breathe into us, through us and around us the sacred source of life blows this breath of life into all of creation. The great modern mystic and Jesuit Pierre Telhard de Chardin offered the vision of the breathing together of all things. We are connected to all of life through breath, to humans, and animals, as well as to trees and plants. Let us be reminded that God has instilled his breath in us, the living, life-giving spirit. He comforts us with his spirit of renewal and love. A reading from the Acts of the Apostles. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly from heaven, there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house right where they were sitting. Divided tongues as of fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. The word of the Lord.
the Spirit came and your church was born in wind and fire and words of power. The Spirit came blowing fear aside and in its place, weak hearts were stronger. The Spirit came as your word foretold with dreams and signs, visions and wonders. The Spirit came and saw all people as equal, equipped and empowered to live your mission. The Spirit came and is here today to stir us into action and to restore hope to God's people. Praying with the gift of air through attention to breath is an ancient Christian practice. One of the earliest known forms is the Jesus Prayer. The idea behind this prayer is that we connect our conscious prayer with each breath so that our awareness of God becomes as natural as our breathing and that we might learn to pray without ceasing. We're now going to engage in a simple breath prayer. And I invite you to simply close your eyes and focus on your breathing in and your breathing out. The words of this prayer said on the in-breath are breathe on us and on the out-breath, spirit of God. We will spend a few moments now in silent contemplation, participating in this ancient practice. Spirit of God, may we breathe in and hold your love within us. May we breathe out and share it with the world. Spirit of God, may we breathe in and hold your peace within us. 
Spirit of God, may we breathe in and hold your life within us. Audrey Brown, she's a facilitator. Good morning, members, and welcome to Session 9. My name is Jacinta Collins, a member of the Plenary Council, and I am your chair for this session. I also introduce Audrey Brown, Audrey Brown, who is our facilitator for the day. Come forward, please, Audrey. Before we commence, can I remind members 
of the caution raised yesterday morning in relation to COVID safety. Uh, masks are recommended. Obviously, as you're speaking, it's not a good idea, but uh, please uh, remember to consider wearing masks. And uh, if you don't have one available with you for one reason or another, you can get them from the health desk. <coughs> We have had three of our members impacted by COVID overnight, so please consider the ongoing risk of exposure to either COVID or the flu. Now, to commence, I ask all members to sign the attendance register located on your table, uh, if you have not done so already. And uh, for the facilitators, please collect these and hand them to the secretary. All of the attendance uh, pages are with the Secretary and we shall now continue the process of discernment from yesterday. The process which led to the consultative vote, uh, the deliberative vote on the motions for yesterday's topics will now occur. This was part three, called for Christ sent forth as missionary disciples, and part four, witnessing the equal dignity of women and men. This deliberative vote will now take place. The motions are motion 3.2, 3.3, 3.4, 3.5, 4.5, and 4.6. And can I ask deliberative voters uh, to please note the back page of motion 4.5? <laughs> Sounds like I don't need to highlight this way, we'll avoid informal votes. Um, now, could I also ask the deliberative voters to please hold up a green card so that they can be identified by the scrutineers. Having participated in the prayer and discernment process for these motions, and with openness to the spirit, I ask the deliberative voters to complete their ballot papers by receiving their ballots um, and taking them to the table situated around the room or to the side of the room. Uh, once you've completed the vote, please place your ballot papers in the baskets provided and return to your table. And during this time, I'll ask other members to remain at your tables and as a community pray in silence for openness to the spirit.
Good mommy. I want no informals today, folks. <laughs> I said to the wrong people, haven't I? <laughs> Scrutineers, please collect and count the vote. <laughs> Members, we would uh, now ordinarily move to consider the minutes, but with the complexity of yesterday's debate, uh, we will defer that consideration to the end of this session the uh, minutes will be circulated on your tables and we would ask that during the course of this session you have a look and uh, satisfy yourselves that those minutes are accurate and I'll return to that consideration at the end of this session. We move now to the timetable and agenda for today which will focus on part five and six as recorded in the block program on the screen or on the back of your lanyard uh, and on your table for the 6th of July. Part five, communion in grace, sacrament to the word. And part six, formation and leadership for mission and ministry. 
The motions which are recorded on pages 29 to 35 in the motions and amendments document and will be considered in session 11 and 12 today. They are motions 5.1, 5.2, 5.3, 5.4, 5.5, 5.6, .5, and motions 6.1, 6.2, 6.3, 6.4, and 6.5. Before I move to consent for the agenda, I ask Bishop Shane to please come forward and explain one issue that has been considered by the steering committee overnight. Thank you, Jacinta. Uh, part five, which we will move to uh, consider and um, make decisions about this from this afternoon, deals, as you know, with prayer liturgy and spirituality. The well-established and very clear protocol at the bishops' conference, for canonical reasons, is that the bishops of the Eastern churches do not vote on matters concerning the liturgy of the Western churches. Uh, and so the, those bishops have requested appropriately that they be removed from the voting pool for uh, the deliberative votes on motions specifically relating to liturgy. So we'll work out exactly which ones they are during the course of today. Uh, it's not quite as simple as saying the whole of part five. Uh, the, and the, uh, the canonical committee agrees with, uh, with that and, uh, and so does the steering committee. In terms of members from the Eastern Churches, the question has then been raised about consultative votes on those matters. Uh, the view of the steering committee, uh, supported by uh, the canonical committee, is that members is to, is to begin from the principle that members are not here, none of us are here, representing the particular group from which we come or which might have nominated and put our name forward. We are all here as members representing the whole of the church in Australia. And we're also very mindful that many of those from one of the Eastern churches also have significant involvement in various ways and familiarity with uh, aspects of the life of the Latin Rite church. And so, uh, so there is a good reason and a good basis on which many of those people might well be able to, and very appropriately, uh, contribute to the consultative vote in a way that, uh, that helpfully informs the deliberative vote of the bishops, even about matters relating to uh, the Latin Rite lit liturgy. Uh, however, all members, are, uh, there is no compulsion to vote on any motion. All members at any time can choose not to vote, can choose to abstain. Uh, and so those members from the Eastern Churches who may feel uh, uncomfortable or that it's inappropriate to be voting on something related to the Western, uh, the Latin Rite liturgy, uh, are reminded of that possibility which is open to them as it is open to all members on any of the votes to abstain. Thank you, Bishop Shane. I now ask the members of the Plenary Council to show consent to the timetable and agenda for the day by raising a green card or a red card and for the scrutineers to note the result. Thank you, that consent has been given. Now again today, to assist us in our ongoing discernment, on the motions before us, I invite two advisers to the Plenary Council to speak on the two topics on the agenda. Firstly, Reverend Professor Richard Lennon on Communion in Grace, Sacrament to the Word, and Dr Nigel Zimmerman, Formation and Leadership for, motion, for, for Mission and Ministry. Um, I ask you both to come forward and I'll provide a brief introduction that was uh, outlined in the documents before us, but uh, some of us may not recall. 
Uh, Richard, was an, uh, Richard was ordained as a priest in 1983 in Maitland, Newcastle, and is professor of systematic theology in the School of Theology and Ministry at Boston College. Some of you may recall Richard from the First Assembly. He's an expert in the theology of church, the theology of ministry, and fundamental theology. He's also published numerous articles and edited several books on the church and its ministry that you'll find in your assembly documents. Thank you, Richard. Thank you, Jacinda. Good morning, everyone. It's lovely to be here with you. The, the motions in part five have to do with the church's liturgical sacramental life, portraying it as a way in which we grow as a communion in grace. So what I'd like to do this morning is give four reflections on grace. First, grace is the self-expression of God. It's the gift of God's own life. And as such, it gives life. Grace is creative with the life-giving love of God. And for that reason, everything that lives, lives in and through grace. Grace is neither rare nor exceptional, but abundant and ever-present. We live and move and have our being in grace. And so grace is an ongoing, permanent invitation to a relationship with God. Second, that generic sense of grace becomes more particular through God's own initiative that remarkably allows what is not God to mediate God. That's the notion of sacramentality. And that has a history. It has a history in God's self-revelation that begins in the covenants with Israel. And through grace, those everyday realities that are part of the story of Israel, the land, the law, the prophets, become means of encounter with God. They are genuinely sacramental. The fullness of the sacramentality of God the self-expression of God in human history is in Jesus Christ. Jesus is grace in human form. Through the words and actions of Jesus, the healing grace of God is present in us as one like us. To comfort, to encourage, to feed and to forgive. And through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, we as human beings, as a human community in the whole of human history, are reconciled to God. And given the promise of a future fulfillment in God, that nothing can come between us and the love of God made visible in Jesus Christ. What God accomplishes in Jesus continues through the gift of the Holy Spirit the fullness of the Trinitarian revelation of God. But the Spirit doesn't become incarnate as Jesus did. There's no person, human reality of the Spirit. What the Spirit does is gather together a community of faith and witness in Jesus Christ. That's us. That's the church. The church exists to be sacrament of God's love to make present that love of God in our world, to recognise where its presence is already, and to nurture and encourage that life of grace in all people. As church, we're not perfect. We're not here to be self-congratulatory or complacent. Rather, we are called to mission and conversion. And that's the third point, then, is if we are to be a community that manifests grace, we need to be nurtured in grace. And that gets to the sacramental and liturgical life of the church. We need to be people nurtured by the word of God, by our sacraments, by our communal life, by our 
personal prayer, by our being together and sharing faith. And through that, we can grow as a community that makes manifest God's justice in our world. Fourth then, the church which exists to manifest this grace has to be a community open to its own conversion. So that we're constantly seeking how might we make this love of God present more fruitfully. And that gets to the motions for part five. They invite you, us, to consider whether and how our liturgy might better reflect this life-giving love of God. They ask us whether our sacramental forms that we have can continue to grow because they have a history. They have changed over time. How might they change today to better reflect the reality of God's people in the world that we are part of? And as ever, the pivotal point for discernment in these motions, as in all our motions, is will they and how will they help us to grow as a community transparent to the grace of God, a community more able to witness to the hope that we have in Christ. Thank you. Thank you very much, Richard. I now invite Dr Nigel Zimmerman to, to come forward. Nigel specialises in policy analysis, strategic planning and engagement. He too has many publications listed in the material before us. His writing and interests include moral theology and continental philosophy, phenomenology and bioethics and contemporary issues facing church communities domestically and abroad. Thank you, Nigel. Thank you. Good morning, friends. It's a privilege to be with you and for us to be a resource to you. Uh, in your important work this week. I will be saying a brief word on formation. And um, I want to begin mindful of what Jesus himself gave us and what he asked of us. Our Lord told us to make disciples. Through Jesus Christ, God's love invites all people to a share in a life of joy and mercy. To serve Christ is to find freedom and love as a disciple. Through baptism, this task belongs to all of us, whatever our personal calling. Each agency, organization, and ministry of the local church is a means of sharing in the work of making disciples through a witness to truth, mercy, and love. It is not a task for a privileged few, but for all of us. To serve the Lord faithfully, we must be prepared and taught, humbly learning the craft of sharing the good news. In other words, to share the gospel, we must be well-formed. Formation is not a word familiar very well to those outside of our tradition, but it's one that we use often. All of us are being formed in some way, whether we are aware of it or not. The ideas and beliefs that shape us over time make us witnesses to those values. Allowing the world to uncritically form us is contrary to to the gospel. To be formed in the school of Christ, we first receive the gift of faith in all its freedom, fan its flame within us, and courageously share it. Such a task requires humility and patience and a share in Christ's cross. Baptism is the point of entry and provides the model for the path of formation as missionary disciples. 
Baptism is not merely a once and for all event, but a rich source of grace throughout one's life, providing for ongoing replenishment, because together we are a people on a journey. And as the Holy Father keeps reminding us, you need replenishment when you are on a journey. All formation, therefore, is a pilgrimage that can only be made fruitfully and fearlessly by being close to Jesus Christ. From this dynamic of repentance, conversion, and mission, the life of discipleship emerges and flourishes. Formation for discipleship in Christ is both a right of the baptized as it is a responsibility of the church. Finding new paths of catechesis and witness, attuned to the needs of the time, is urgent and fundamental to our mission. To find new paths and be able to speak the word of Christ fruitfully, a consistent and clear vision of what our mission is will guide every formative experience. While we all need formation in Christ, those who aspire to leadership, and I'm conscious I'm speaking to a room of leaders, will be committed to his mission with a creativity and sensitivity, always, as Gadim Etzbez says, led by the Spirit. As Jesus promised, out of good treasure in the heart, good will grow, and we will be known by our fruits. Thank you. Thank you, Nigel, and thank you again, Richard. We now say farewell to those joining us through the live streaming, and we continue to appreciate your support and prayer to guide us through this assembly. I now hand over to our facilitator, Audrey Brown, to lead us in a time of reflection and table dialogue.